Batsurkiv, who is a spokesperson of the Special Monitoring Mission OSC in Ukraine. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. As uh, previous time, I will speak Ukrainian this time. Welcome to this uh, regular briefing of the OSC Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine. During the last uh, several days, uh, SMM observed uh, that uh, a heavy artillery is not used, and uh, we saw we saw uh, received a. Uh, information uh, about uh, using uh, small arms this week. The, we had uh, some difficulties in, uh, with access uh, to checkpoints, uh, checkpoints under uh, control of um, militants. Last yesterday, we observed uh, the process of uh, collecting uh, fragments, uh, remnants of uh, MH17, uh, that's the result of our efforts uh, to get uh, easier access uh, to the, uh, the site, to the crash site. The number of our um, monitors is the same like, like last week. We have 338 international monitors in more than 10 locations throughout Ukraine and also about two-thirds are based in eastern Ukraine. Here there are some highlights from our latest uh, spot report and daily reports. The first, on uh, December 12, SMM uh, visited uh, uh, interna uh, remnants of the National uh, Odessa Airport. Uh, we saw completely destroyed a uh, terminal and uh, a lot of um, holes, a lot of um, uh, shells um, that ha have not exploded and uh, the remnants uh, of uh, the airport. Because of security, SMM was not able to, uh, to see uh, damaged, uh, damages uh, uh, to the runway. And then SMM observed a uh, rotation of Ukrainian uh, military men and disloc dislocated in Donetsk airport. 48 Ukrainian military men received uh, to replace uh, replaced, uh, 51. Mem members of uh, DNR promised uh, secure, uh, secure uh, retreat uh, through uh, the territory controlled uh, by DNR. On the 14th, uh, for December uh, 14, we visited the Shirokino, which is uh, under DNA. Our monitors uh, planned uh, to visit in Novozovsk. That was uh, the sixth effort of SMM to uh, visit that uh, place. They went uh, through Shirokino, where they were stopped on a checkpoint by so called DNA, and they were prohibited uh, to move further. The reason was not explained. Three, uh, December 15, the patrol of SMM of uh, two uh, armored vehicles got under the crossfire uh, of uh, small arms. There were, f there were, f there were uh, shelling at uh, Donetsk um, airport. Nobody, uh, no, no victims. Vehicles of SMM uh, were not uh, damaged. SMM involved, uh, informed that on December uh, 16, in uh, the Center on Con Control and Coordination, or JCCC, there was a, a replacement of the leadership from Russia and uh, from Ukraine. In it is five. Yesterday in the office uh, in Kiev, SMM, we had one one day meeting between the representatives of Swiss uh, uh, chairmanship in OSCE and also the next uh, Serbian uh, uh, leadership. I would like to remind you that the next year Serbia will chair uh, OSCE. In the end, I would like uh, to to tell you that uh, the head of the mission 
possible uh, Ambassador Apokan will make uh, his uh, first uh, trip uh, to Lviv uh, tomorrow. There he will have a meeting with the mayor and acting governor. Plus, he will participate in a round table organized uh, by Lviv uh, Business uh, School. And there he will give a lecture on uh, Ukrainian Catholic University. For media, there will be an unofficial media briefing on uh, at uh, 3.45 p.m. In, and we'll give you more detailed information there through uh, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, yet, yet We've handed out the second edition of our uh, bi-weekly status report. And uh, there's a very interesting photo on that status report, and that is of uh, one of the images taken by our uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, um, which are based in Mariupol. And uh, in the near future, we hope to be able to share with you more of the product from the aerial vehicles uh, in terms of images and perhaps even video. But we'll have to wait a few more days for that. So do you, do you keep it in you? Any question? About these UAVs, uh, sure. what's this kind of the status right now? Since there have been this kind of reports about upgrades of software to avoid this kind of jamming, which has been taken place somewhere in the southeast of, of Donetsk yeah. Oblast. Um, well, first of all, the UAVs uh, we regard them as part of our uh, team of monitors. Um, we have four of them, and they're equipped with uh, very high-tech uh, Canadian-made uh, cameras. Now. They do fly, um, although they are subject to weather. And at this time of year, you'll understand that in that many parts of Ukraine, you have a low ceiling. So um, their ability to fly and to capture images is limited. However, um, they have produced, uh, I would say, quite interesting uh, results. We have been reviewing them over the past few days. And in terms of their um, ability to fly, they have been subject in the past to uh, military grade, uh, military grade electronic jamming. Now, when that happened, uh, we went back to the manufacturer, uh, which is Schiebel in Austria, and uh, we asked them for a solution. They came up with one, and uh, since then, the UAVs have been retrofitted, and they haven't uh, been subject to any of these problems. Now, having said that, um, there were at least there was at least one occasion where there was live fire directed at the UAVs, and we do have that uh, captured. On, 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 in video, and um, fortunately the live fire did not hit the UAVs, but it just goes to show that they are um, vulnerable in a sense to, to aerial um, live fire uh, from, the, from the ground. Just when did you start again uh, using them after this kind of upgrade, and uh, are you able to monitor the, the borderline between Russia and Ukraine, for example? Um, they, they resumed uh, flying just uh, a few days ago, um, and again, they've been very effective in seeing um, w with great detail images uh, from the ground. Um, and in terms of uh, border monitoring, because they're based in uh, Mariupol, they do have a range of about uh, 100 kilometers or so. So in theory, they could go right up to the borderline. But at the moment, uh, they're being deployed to the uh, uh, con in the area around the contact line. Uh, and again, they've captured very, very interesting images. I have to say as well, um, again, we almost don't distinguish between the UAVs and the, the human monitors. But we, we're asked a lot of questions about border monitoring because obviously it's a big issue. And um, uh, Ambassador Apakan, our uh, chief monitor, has uh, said that the mission is uh, committed to doing some sort of border monitoring. However, there are a number of constraints. Um, as I said, we're right now we're at about uh, 338 monitors. Our target is to reach 500 monitors by uh, middle of January. So when we have more monitors, as well as uh, armed vehicles, which are essential, we'll be able to monitor more territory. That border, uh, especially the piece of the border, which is in um, territory not controlled by the Ukrainian government, is very, very long 
400 plus uh, kilometers, if I'm not mistaken. So it, it will it would take a lot of resources to do very uh, intensive uh, border monitoring. So it remains to be seen. But um, again, our uh, monitors uh, are working 24/7 pretty much um, in terms of collecting uh, information on what they see on the ground. And uh, the other thing I have to say in terms of border monitoring and monitoring in general is the the security situation. There are times where there are some non-go areas. Um, for example, in Southern Lohan Square, we have to be very careful how we deploy them. I hope that answers your question. Are there more questions? I would, I would like to ask whether you have any information about activities of pro-Ukrainian guerrillas or partisans who are organizing some adversary actions on the occupied territories and whether they try to assist Ukrainian servicemen. And the second question, whether you observed um, handling of humanitarian aid, so-called Ukraine uh, humanitarian aid from Russian territory of humanitarian aid delivered by Renat Ahmeta Foundation. Uh, so my question is, what if you observed whether there were fo just food staff or supplies for peaceful population or arms? don't have any information at the moment on that, but uh, I would encourage you to keep a close eye on our daily reports, which are online, by the way, in English, uh, Ukrainian and Russian, and anything we actually see will be in there. In terms of um, the delivery of humanitarian aid, if I could answer that first of all, that um, just as recently as yesterday, our chief monitor, Ambassador Apakan, um, did reiterate um, our, our growing concern about the humanitarian situation. We're talking about the humanitarian situation of um, unarmed civilians in the conflict zone itself. We're talking about uh, unarmed innocent civilians um, in, in those villages along the contact line, like Trekhozbenka, which we visited. And then there are the 520,000 at least registered uh, IDPs, internally displaced people, who have uh, fled to other parts of Ukraine. Probably the number of IDPs in total is closer to a million. So in other words, we're talking about a huge number of uh, needy people. And also um, our partners, um, you know, we're working with the humanitarian community, uh, World Food Program, UNICEF, for instance, are, are starting um, more and more to raise the alarm bell in terms of the vulnerable population. What we mean by that are women, uh, children, and the disabled that are in these different areas and are um, very much struggling uh, with very little resources. Um, in, in a lot of villages, uh, there's no electricity, uh, no uh, heating. Um, I guess we can say we've been lucky in a sense in the past few days, the winter hasn't been as fierce as one would expect at this time of year. But it's very important, uh, we feel, to raise the alarm bell, to make the international community aware that the needs could be very, very great and the number of vulnerable could very much increase. In terms of the delivery of humanitarian aid, in the past week or so, um, remember we have two border monitor, we have two missions. We have the special monitoring mission to Ukraine of which uh, we are part of. And then we have the much smaller border checkpoint monitoring mission on the Ukrainian-Russian border. The latter mission has reported on the crossing of uh, columns of vehicles from Russia that have the sign bearing humanitarian aid. And then in the past week, uh, I believe it was in Luhansk Oblast, our own monitors have observed the unloading of uh, dry goods, I would say it that way, for civilian population. I think there was also some vehicles that had um, some equipment to help rebuild uh, infrastructure or utilities. But um, I have to say that in many cases, our ability to actually uh, monitor what uh, is inside the vehicles or how it's actually distributed is quite limited. So, um, and then I'll also um, remind you, if I can, that uh, uh, we're a civilian monitoring mission, so we don't ourselves actually deliver aid, but when we do, when we are in a position to monitor it, uh, we will report on it. 
but lastly, in terms of the private initiative you mentioned, um, I, w I was made aware of that yesterday from journalists' uh, questions, but uh, as far as I can see in our reporting today, we don't have anything on it, but if we do, of course, we will share it with you. Um, one more question. Please, could you just interpret this kind of, there was this kind of meeting of a, of a guy called Motorola and a guy called Cupola on, at, the area, at the area of Donetsk airport a few days ago. And this was kind of featured by Live News. Maybe just could you explain this role of OSCE OSC, and Live News and this kind of, you embedded them they embedded you, who was embedded No, um, how, how in my, um, in my uh, uh, summary of what we've been doing and what we've been seeing over the past few days, I did uh, mention uh, that we were there when this exchange of, uh, w when this rotation of Ukrainian uh, servicemen happened. So it was at around that time. Uh, I know on uh, video there was some images of our uh, people there, but they weren't part of that uh, dialogue. But we were there to, again, monitor the, uh, the rotation of Ukrainian servicemen. Um, the other thing I can tell you uh, on that particular uh, location is that uh, we're being very, very careful in terms of accessing Donetsk airport. As you know, it's been a source of some very, the location of some very fierce fighting. The, Safety and security of our monitors, of course, is a priority. So we reassess sometimes a few days at a time on whether it's safe to go there or not. So um, tomorrow, when you look at our daily report, you'll be able to tell whether we're able to access that area or not. So. All right. Um, are there any more questions? Shanovan Nikolaevich, yes, she has uh, I have a question regarding drones and armed vehicles. Are you expecting any more uh, of the armed vehicles and drones also to assist you in your operations? Thank okay. you. Hmm. Well, first of all, they're armored vehicles. They aren't armed vehicles. So uh, re remember, we're an unarmed civilian mission. Um, in terms of the armored vehicles, um, the number we're, tar we're, we're headed for to acquire is well over 100. Um, each uh, vehicle can accommodate about four people. And if we're going to have about, for example, 350 um, people in the eastern Ukraine, they all require transport by armored vehicle. They can't go in what we call soft skin vehicles. Um, so it's, um, we're, we're hopeful that by the end of the year we'll have enough of these um, armored vehicles to, um, to accommodate our monitors and then hence we can expand our monitoring capabilities. Uh, in terms of the um, unmanned area vehicles or so-called drones, we have four at the moment. Uh, they're all um, manufactured by the same manufacturer, Schiebel in Austria. Um, I think the best thing I can say about that is that we're still in that kind of, uh, well, we're observing phase, but uh, we're also seeing what the capabilities of these um, drones are. They're, um, they take a lot of effort uh, to maintain, to operate, and they're very expensive as well. Uh, I know that other countries have expressed interest in um, sending more of these uh, aero vehicles uh, to the mission and perhaps with their own operators, but that's something that would be further discussed in Vienna and at the Permanent Council um, of the OSCE. And the next one, by the way, takes place in, in January. And one more question, who will provide uh, the vehicles for the mission, uh, the, the over 100 that you uh -huh. had? Well, they come from um, a variety of sources. For example, um, the United Kingdom provided uh, 10 vehicles uh, just recently. Um, and these were uh, very uh, robust vehicles with all the telecommunications equipment already in them. So of course, we're very grateful to the participating state, the UK. Um, also, uh, we've been able to secure some other vehicles from other OSC emissions uh, in the region. And um, financing for brand new vehicles which we purchase comes from participating states. So um, it comes from a variety of sources, but I think everyone has gotten the message that it's very, very important. In fact, it's crucial for us to have armored vehicles in eastern Ukraine. Their um, almost uh, they're, they're the protection which they provide has been proven on several occasions already. They're very very strong vehicles, but um, we're looking forward to having a full 
uh, fleet, if you if you may, by if, by the uh, end of the year, hopefully. Um, the other thing I can explain, maybe it's too much detail, is that, like, for example, on airline, we look for a uniformed fleet because if you have many different manufacturers or you have uh, gas or diesel vehicles, they're very difficult to maintain and service. So we're looking as much as possible to have a very uniform fleet. Level Fovska, Euromaidan PR, military expert and uh, current MP Dmitry Timchuk in his report of 14th December mentioned a convoy of Russian troops uh, on the move from uh, Uspenka, which is close to the border, deep into the territory of Ukraine, included one APC, accompanied by uh, a vehicle bearing an OSC sign. Could you please comment on that? Yeah, um, well, Mr. Timchuk, uh, I know he's very widely followed, and we've had um, at least one or two occasions now where he's reported on our location somewhere, and we that information was not fact-checked with us. So as with all people who are writing online or in the media, when you are about to report on uh, the activities of the OSC, OSC we are available 24-7 and we encourage you to contact us. But uh, up until now, I've not received, uh, I think, one phone call from him and his team about that information. So hence, we encourage uh, uh, you know, more kind of uh, interaction with us so we can make sure that the information is accurate. I don't have information on that particular um, incident, uh, if it did indeed happen. Uh, but I can tell you that we have been reporting quite regularly, not recently, but in the past few weeks, about the movement of unmarked um, uh, military convoys. Um, in the cases that we saw, most of them have come from the direction of the east towards Donetsk City. And um, in quite a few cases, they've been towing um, heavy artillery. In terms of heavy artillery, we're talking about 120 millimeter howitzers and uh, multiple rocket launch uh, systems. So um, again, I encourage you to follow our daily reports. And uh, in there, you will see uh, when we do actually see something, again, we don't speculate, we don't um, report on uh, movements that we don't actually see with our own eyes, but anything we see of significance will be in the daily report. Um, All right, in case if there are no questions, um, I would like to thank uh, Michael Baturki for the press briefing. Uh, we're, we're always uh, welcome to host you for um, other uh, reports and press briefings at uh, Ukraine Crisis Media Center. Thank you very much. Have a good day.